Sure. Um, well, uh, I'm going to give a, a presentation. I'll, I'll kind of rip through the start just so we can get to the uh, just so we can get into the code um, to focus on a little bit, uh, just so you can see what you can do with HTML. But my talk is uh, called on JavaScript, and uh, uh, the subtitle is writing JavaScript to avoid writing JavaScript. And what I want to do is I want to give a, a very brief history of web development and then talk about a potential fork in the road where the industry went one way. And I'm proposing that we go back and examine that fork and maybe think about what uh, could have happened if uh, we'd taken the other, the other fork in, that, in the road at that point. So um, I am a contrarian by nature. Um, I, I, I feel like this goose is my spirit animal. Um, so I'm gonna cause some problems uh, on purpose here on JS Day for JetBrains, so I apologize for that. I also love this meme. Um, this is the inventor of Lisp, uh, McCarthy. He was a professor at Stanford, and uh, he uh, he just he has that look. And sometimes when I look at web development, um, I, I, I sympathize with this look. Um, I feel like we're all doing it completely wrong. So let me explain how we got here and uh, what I think we could be doing different in some cases, at least. I'm a pragmatic. Um, at the end of the day. So you're at this conference to learn about JavaScript. Um, and in particular, you're here to learn about the latest and greatest libraries and techniques that have arisen in the last couple of days. Um, and maybe to memorialize some of the many libraries and techniques that were invented a few weeks ago, which are now passe. We're not using those anymore. This is JavaScript. So um, it's always the new, the new stuff here. Um, and uh, that's that's part of the culture at this point in the JavaScript community. There's uh, been a lot of dramatic change, um, even by the tech technology sector standards that the JavaScript community is uh, particularly bonkers. Um, and uh, as a JavaScript developer, um, it's crucial that you stay on the leading edge of this front, front end technology wave and back end increasingly in order to remain employable. Um, but I'm not going to talk about any of that. I'm not going to help you stay employable, at least not in the short run. Um, instead, I'm going to talk about something old and boring, um, something that uh, is, dare I say, uh, stable, HTML. I know. HTML, it's boring. It's dumb. Like It's this janky UI description, description language that we have to use. And uh, they haven't done anything interesting with HTML in, in almost a decade. HTML5 is almost a decade old now. So really just this boring and uh, annoying uh, uh, UI infrastructure that we have to use when we're building our JavaScript applications. But it turns out that we can fix it. And in particular, we can fix it with JavaScript. So <clears throat> let's do a brief history of the web. Um, web development started back in really more the late 1990s, and it was based on this notion of hypermedia. This was a new concept, uh, not a new concept in general, but it was a new concept of, in uh, broad adoption. And so uh, we're all used to HTML. But that's the hypermedia that we, that we work in, uh, in um, for the most part. Um, and this was a really a radically new way of building and distributing software. Um, and it, it should be contrasted with the older, earlier thick clients that were being built. So if you're old enough uh, to, like me to remember thick clients in the 80s and 90s, they were, uh, they were uh, you know, applications that you ran locally and that communicated with some system um, over sockets typically. And uh, that, that was not a hypermedia interaction, rather that was a data interaction with the back end. <clears throat> Um, so Roy Fielding is a gentleman who was present sort of when the web was being spun up. He was a, a crucial engineer in a lot of the fundamental technologies that were built up, uh, like around the Apache web server and so forth. And he gave us a couple of terms. Um, he wrote a, uh, his, his uh, PhD um, thesis included uh, this, these terms, uh, REST and then Hadios. Hadios wasn't actually called out specifically in the paper. It was something that kind of got tacked on later. But there was this notion of REST and Hadios that came out uh, that described the early web. And it's important to understand because you've probably heard these terms um, used in terms of JSON APIs. But when they were initially coined, there were no JSON APIs. Uh, this was a description of the web. It was a description of the way the web worked where there were servers exchanging hypermedia uh, back and forth. Just a very different model. 
So what was this new model that Roy uh, described? Well, it was stateless. There weren't persistent connections. It was layered. That's not that important. I um, mean, it had this, this uh, interesting feature that really was, I think, the core distinction between, uh, between the web uh, architecture and earlier thick clients um, in that there was a uniform interface. And what that means is that um, you had a client that is a web browser that would retrieve a, uh, a representation of a resource, say, go to google.com, and it gets back some HTML that represents that resource. Um, and the client didn't really know what was going on at that endpoint. It just got back HTML. And so the 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 um, the network interactions were ag the the client was sort of agnostic uh, towards what was coming back. It could be a contact that was coming back. It could be a car information around a car. The the browser itself didn't know anything about what contacts were, or what cars were, or what search was. All it knew was how to render HTML. And so it gave it this very new and unique network architecture um, that was very flexible, um, kind of janky in some ways, but very flexible in others. Uh, very resilient. So <clears throat> that can all be brie uh, briefly summed up as Web 1.0. And if you've ever heard the term Web uh, 1.0, it's easily used as a uh, as a criticism of older style web apps. Um, and uh, things were things were great in Web 1.0. Uh, stuff was you know we were delivering fe uh, pet food, uh, which I guess actually they're trying to do again. Um, and it was really a, a, an amazing time. But there was one problem. Um, the UIs were pretty terrible. So this is what Amazon looked like back in the day. Um, they were pretty terrible. And uh, so um, to address this problem, these, these sort of terrible UIs, people started working in this technology that was almost by accident included in early browsers, JavaScript, uh, created by Brennan Eich. Um, and JavaScript, when com combined with a new technology called Ajax, allowed you to start making uh, web requests uh, uh, to the back end, uh, to, to a back end, um, out, sort of out of band, not, not in the same way you would normally with links and forms. And this allowed for much richer web applications to be built. Um, and eventually these applications became so large <clears throat> that um, people started building infrastructure to manage these, uh, these applications. And so this is where Angular and React and now Vue and all these other um, libraries have come out of. And they've, they've sort of been all piled into this uh, notion of single page application frameworks, single page uh, for single page applications, where the focus is no longer on exchanging hypermedia with a server and transitioning between pages, but rather um, is focused on sort of microtransactions done over JSON. Everyone here is familiar with this. This is what probably 99% of you do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I get it. Now I'm going to tell you why you shouldn't be doing it that way. No, not yet. We'll get there. So um, the SPA movement really did away with this notion of pages and moved to a very JavaScript-centric view of the world. So you've got a JavaScript model living in memory. HTML is there, but it's usually client-side templates, some sort of you know janky, it's a janky GUI description language that we have to use because that's just what's there. Um, and uh, you know, as again, as I said, this is what everyone expects people to talk about at conferences like this. Um, but I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. Instead of teaching you about new things and it can actually land you a job, I'd like to go back to that fork in the road where um, the UIs were not good. Um, we had this problem where like this full page refresh problem and we decided to go down the JavaScript SPA path and think what if we hadn't done that? What if instead of going down that path, what if we had said, all right, how can we extend hypermedia to give us a better um, to give us a better user experience. Let's stay within, let's take this other route and let's stay within the world of hypermedia, but let's figure out how we can make hypermedia more effective for building uh, for building web applications. Um, so on this fork, what if we had said, well, okay, what if anchor tags and forms weren't the only types of elements that could issue requests? And what if we allowed other events to trigger requests, not just click or submit? And what if finally put patch and delete and all that stuff was available in just vanilla HTML? What if I didn't have to use JavaScript to get access to that stuff? And then finally, and this is the really important one, what if uh, we said, hey, we don't need to replace the whole screen. 
with this hypermedia interaction. Instead, we need to replace just some part of the screen with the hypermedia interaction. So what if we drove hyper the HTML forward so that it could do all this stuff? Um, and uh, it turns out that if we had done that, if we had done that, then um, we could have imp we could implement a lot of UI patterns purely in uh, HTML. So things that right now you probably think of as needing JavaScript, such as active search or inline editing, lazy loading, and infinite scroll. These are all examples of features that today people would say to themselves, well, I need to kick out to JavaScript to do any of this stuff. But <clears throat> unfortunately, they didn't advance. Uh, HTML very much past HTML5. Um, so we're kind of stuck with it. Or are we? Well, it turns out that we have a technology um, that's built into the browser that lets us go beyond what vanilla HTML gives us, JavaScript. And so what if we used JavaScript to fix HTML? What if we use JavaScript to avoid using JavaScript? I think we can all agree that would be a wonderful thing, can't we? Um, so that brings us to HTMX. HTMX is my attempt to do exactly that. It's a small, relatively small JavaScript library that allows you to implement uh, a lot of um, modern UX patterns without writing any JavaScript and staying within this original model of the web, within the hypermedia model of the web. Um, and so here's some code, and we're going to kick over and look at this uh, live in a second. But here's the code for implementing active search. Active search being when I type into an input, the search results come up uh, automatically. Um, so there's no JavaScript. It's just declarative. Uh, it's just declarative HTML. And we can implement a much better UI. So um, what HTMX consists of is a series of attributes which can be put on elements in your DOM, and they tell HTMX what to do. So uh, for example, here on this input, we're going to issue a post to the search uh, URL. Um, we're going to trigger that request when a key up occurs, that, um, and uh, no key up has occurred in the last 500 milliseconds. That debounces the input, so we're not hammering the server. And uh, when we get the results back, we're going to put them into this search results div uh, in our UI by using this HX target attribute. And then finally, we're going to show an indicator so that people know something's going on as we search. All right, this is a this is all it takes to implement a much better uh, user interface for uh, something like Active Search. All right, <clears throat> so we're when we do this, we're not we're not expecting back JSON from the server. HTMX doesn't expect JSON back from the server. Rather, it expects hypermedia expects HTML back from the server, and so we're staying very much within the original model of the web. We're exchanging hypermedia with a server. We're just doing it in a more advanced way than we would have previously, than we would have given just the normal tools that HTML gave us. Um, and so we have a much more expressive hypermedium now. And uh, we can implement quite a, few, uh, quite a few features. So let me kick over really quick out of my presentation and just show you. Um, if you go to htmx.org examples, there's an active search example underneath it. There's a bunch of other examples as well that you can look at. But again, we have our code here. Um, we have an input. We have a uh, HX post saying post uh, this post uh, um, to this URL. Um, we have a trigger that says key up changed delay colon 500 milliseconds. This is saying on the key up event, um, if the value has changed in the input, so don't send a request if someone hits an arrow key and doesn't change the value. Um, the, and uh, if no other key up has occurred in the last 500 milliseconds, um, then issue a request that debounces the, the input so we're not hammering our server. Um, take that result and jam it down into the thing with this, uh, with this ID. And you can see down here uh, in this table, the T body has that uh, ID in it. And uh, so on all of these example pages, I try, to, I try to put some actual live code in. And what you can see here is uh, we can type uh, AE. And sure enough, it searches. And we scroll down a little bit. And you can see these are the results that have AE. Um, and uh, if we uh, add S, it's going to filter it down further. So we're filtering down the results here. We're getting the results back from the server in HTML form. And we're jamming them into this table. Great. And this is all the code that it took. This is all the code, quote unquote. HTML is not a programming language, I've been reliably informed. Um, but that's all it took in order to enable this. Again, once again, firmly within the original model of the web. So 
wonderful. Um, and uh, there's also, you can, uh, if, if you'd like, when you're on the HTMX page, um, you can, uh, uh, there's a little sort of indicator or a little section that shows you exactly what requests were made. So we can see there was the initial state with all this, uh, with all this HTML. And then we uh, issue a post to search with AE. Um, and then we just got back the table rows that were just the results. And then the next post I typed uh, S. And so we just got back those two rows, result, rows that had AES in them. All right. So again, staying firmly within the original model of the web, a few attributes allow us to implement a much richer user experience uh, in the hypermedia paradigm. Great. Everything's wonderful. Let's go back to the presentation. So thank you, JavaScript, for making it possible by using you to not use you. We will never forget you, JavaScript, but we will never use you again. Uh, you, will all, you will all use JavaScript for the rest of your careers. It's fine. Am I seriously advocating abandoning JavaScript? Yes, absolutely. 100%. No, I'm not. Um, JavaScript's a fundamental technology for the web, and all web developers should learn it. And the vast majority of jobs for the next decade, at least, are going to involve uh, are going to involve JavaScript um, <clears throat> of, of front end jobs, I should say. Regardless of that fact, and I, I recognize that I'm sort of an outsider here, or contrarian at this conference. Um, I do think that it's useful, even if you think this is crazy, to go back and take a look at hypermedia, and when appropriate, consider using a hypermedia approach rather than today's JavaScript-centric approach. Um, it's it, it, it's uh, the advantages of this model are uh, simplicity, reliability. Um, there's an incremental nature to it that's really nice. You don't have to bite off a whole framework to get things going. You can just throw active search on one spot in your app and everything's good. Um, but uh, the hypermedia concept, I think, has been abandoned, largely abandoned today um, uh, in favor of JSON APIs. And uh, there was a lot of good stuff there. So I think it's worth, even if you're not sold on HTMX, uh, thinking a little bit about the hypermedia architecture, which has been lost. Um, someone, uh, Tom McWright has a blog, and at one point he was asking, he was looking at the situation with SPAs and thinking, you know, what if thing, what if we're wrong? We've been wrong before, and the industry has been wrong before. I don't think the industry is wrong here necessarily in adopting uh, JavaScript uh, so much, but I do think that we're uh, doing ourselves a disservice by not considering the hypermedia model um, and, uh, and tools like HTMX that uh, use that model rather than the more RPC-oriented JavaScript model that is so dominant today. Um, this is at the top of, if you go to HTMX underscore org, which is the Twitter account, this is the pinned uh, tweet. And uh, uh, this is, I think, if you if you do uh, if you do like the hypermedia approach, I recommend printing this out and taping it to your computer somewhere because we're there's not a bunch of us right now. Uh, but I think it's a small but growing group that's recognizing, hey, there was something neat to hypermedia, and uh, using some of these new, more modern tools that are uh, emphasizing the hypermedia approach, uh, maybe we can uh, we can build some new and interesting applications. All right, so I hope I've caused problems on purpose.